let's start with taking a look at highlights. And then um, there's a few other kind of technical points. People had questions about long necked birds. And, and also, um, and also we brought, excuse me, uh, not right now. Okay, we're, we're, we're doing, that's, that's, that's rude to interrupt. Okay, sorry about that everybody that, you know. Um, so the, uh, we'll do some stuff on long neck birds. Um, excuse me. And um, also a uh, difference between coyote and fox. We'll see if we can do three things. You think I can, Brian? We'll see, we'll see. Sometimes I just get so distracted by the first fun topic that pops up. And, and then we'll, we'll see what we can do with that. Um, all right, let's, let's start just thinking about highlights because um, let me jump to the, oh, you know what would be the best? An object, an object to highlight. And now I need a flashlight, a flashlight. Hold on, hold on. Uh, there's one on the phone. Okay, so a uh, question about highlights. Um, so we're going to do a little bit with highlights and then we're going to do the long neck birds. And, um, and, and then we will um, also uh, see if we can have a chance to, to just sort of differences between coyotes and foxes. Um, so I have a light. And I have an object. And so the, um, I used to think that what the highlight was, was the point on the apple that was, if you were to kind of draw a line down from the, the apple, um, where the light hits the apple, I thought that that's where my highlight is. But it's not. Notice that when I put the light over here, and so I've got the light facing towards me, you're seeing a highlight in this area on my apple, right? What the highlight is, so my camera on my computer is right up here, sort of imagine it going towards uh, up there. Um, so what's happening is light is coming down from my camera. It's hitting the apple and it's bouncing back to you. Um, as um, if I hold my flashlight around like this, so as, as I move the flashlight around, you can see that highlight, the ref, sort of the, the image of the, of, the, of the camera, of the, of the light moving around there. Um, I used to think that that was that, that sort of in, diagrammatically light up here, light comes down, highlight is the point, like the shortest line between this, like the part that's going to be the brightest. Yeah, it is the part of the brightest. I thought it was the part that, uh, here's what I thought it was. I used to think that the highlight was the part of the apple that is getting the most light. And it's not. Isn't that weird? The highlight is not the part of the apple that is getting the most light. It's the part of the apple that is at the right angle to bounce the reflection of the light to your eye. And that's different than the part that is getting the most light. So if you look at this, um, you see that there's sort of the light zone on top and then there's the shadow zone on the bottom, right? Um, I, well, actually, let me see if this is going to work better over here with the, uh, let's go to the document camera. Object, turn off this light. All right, so um, when I, let's see, I'll do this over from, side. All right, so you can see the little reflection of the light moving around as I'm moving the flashlight. You see that little highlight location. 
So that highlight location you see is a line coming from the, the, uh, the, the flashlight. It is hitting the apple, right? And then bouncing up to your eye. The general light side of the apple is the side that is receiving light. So no matter where you are, you will see the light side and the dark side of the apple. Like if, if, um, like if I were to say that, like, you know, right about in here is the boundary line between the right, bright side and the dark side of the apple, right? No matter where I stand in the room, the light side will still be the light side and the dark side will be, still be the dark side. So the light, the, dark, the light side and the dark side are because of the position of the light itself. The highlight is because of the position of the light and the position of your eye. So if there were, if we were all in the same room and we were looking at the same apple under the same light source, but we were all standing around it from different positions, some, uh, all of us would see the highlight in a slightly different location and some wouldn't see it at all. Your highlight, just like a reflection, is a relationship between you and that reflecting surface. And that's different than what is light and what is dark. So I used to draw it like this. Let's see if I can figure out how to turn off this. There we go. I used to draw it like this. I would think to myself, um, all right, uh, where is where's the regular pencil? So let's just sort of take that sort of generic sphere and we'll zoom down on that. Bonk, bonk. All right, there we are. If light is coming from this direction, there's going to be an area in this zone that is brighter and it's going to get darker as you go over here. So this is your, sort of your classic, um, if, if the angle of the light comes in like this, show you kind of a cool little trick here. I'm going to draw that line across it and then at right angles draw this. So if the light is coming in from this angle here, the shadows on this, um, I'm going to basically make little moon shapes here, 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 here. And on this side, it's going to be lighter. And as I get towards this side, it's going to be darker. So um, if this is just out of outer space and there's no um, object giving you reflected light, this zone out here is your darkest. Then we get a little bit lighter in here. And then we get a little bit lighter in here. And then we get a little bit lighter in here. And we get even lighter in here. If the light on the other hand is actually shining down on this spot right here. Oh, let me move this up. Look at that. I moved my screen all by myself. So imagine now you are up, the, the, the light is going to be coming down towards the object like this. So it's not just coming in straight on the side. It's now coming sort of down, um, so the, the, uh, from your side. That means the spot that's gonna receive the most light is in here. 
And as we go out from that, we are going to get darker and darker, All right? So I'm putting these things in. So these, by the way, I'm not talking about highlights, but I'm just talking about light and dark parts. I'm gonna superimpose the highlight on this in just a moment. So in this sort of a thing, Sorry, this is going to be here. My darkest is going to be over here. It's going to get lighter in an arc and then lighter. As I go up the beach ball, it's getting lighter. So straight from the side and, um, and then the light is kind of on your side. Now, if the light is actually coming from, so this ball is backlit a little bit, we'll to put in one more sphere here. Um, if the light is now coming from some point back here, towards this object, so, but it's behind it. So if I drew a line through that light, it would hit on the opposite side somewhere in there, go through our object out this side. That means the darkest point is gonna be here on the side opposite from where the light is. And we are going to get lighter as we go towards go up there towards the light. Now I'm gonna make this whole thing slightly more complicated by adding in reflected light, which is still not the highlight yet. We're gonna add in the idea of reflected light. And the way reflected light, I'm gonna turn off all the lights in this room. this on here and I am going to uh, turn off the light here. And turn my phone back on. All right, now let's see how I can make this work. All right, we are, there is, yeah, no, ah, bear with me for just a moment here. Um, oops. Um, Oh, sorry, my um, camera keeps wanting to go out. I want, what's, sorry, the, the reason this is taking me so long to kind of do the simple thing of get the apple in the middle is because my screen is reversed. And uh, um, the, it is, uh, my, my, my brain has a, a hard time um, switching all these, these elements around. So where's the middle of this? So there, all right, there is, no. Okay, I think I can get this to work now. All right, so um, what I want to do is we are over here, the um, highlight, Right, or the, the bright part is facing towards us. We're seeing like the full moon. 
If I swing over here more into half moon position, what I'd like you to do is to notice on that shadow side, there's a little glow of light that is kind of creeping up on the, on the, on the back side over here. And what is going on is that there is light that is bouncing off. You see how this area here is more illuminated than this area? Watch that again. See that? This area down here is more illuminated than this area up here. Why is that? That's because there's light that is bouncing off the paper and coming up here and lighting up this side. It's reflected light. So very often, if an object is on a surface, you will see that reflected light. There's no reflected light up here because there's nothing bouncing back here. So light is coming, hitting the paper and then bouncing back up and brightening up that side of the apple. That's reflected light. And now I'm gonna add that into our little diagram here. Nope. <clears throat> So if I'm trying to keep this straight, I want to put some of these objects on the ground. So if this object here is on the ground here, so this is the ground surface down here, the light is coming this way. It's going to be casting a shadow out this way. So if the light direction is coming here, we're going to continue with that direction. So this area here is going to be the cast shadow of that object. And in this back side here, this dark side here, that's where my reflected light is going to be. So you'd think it's going to be the darkest point on this. But really, I'm going to come back in here with an eraser and I'm just going to put in a little bit of a, of a reflected light moment back there. So it's not going to be as, as, as bright as this light here, but this is light that is hitting the paper and then coming up and touching the underside where I'd expect it to be just oh so dark. Um, now let's think about the highlight. The highlight is a completely separate phenomenon. And highlights you only find on smooth uh, reflective surfaces. So if this is a dull ball, a matte ball, I'm not going to have any highlights on it. But if it is a smooth, shiny surface, there will be a crisp highlight on it. And that highlight location is going to move around. Uh, if you know, here's where the light is hitting, right? And the the where the and the light that would hit right here on this spot. If it hits right here, this light that, that hits right here on this spot, right here, bounces straight back up this way. It bounces back into the light. So if I put my apple, ah, keep losing my, right, so here's my apple. Um, the light right now is coming from right next to my camera. So the shadow side you don't see, you are only seeing the light bright side of the apple. And it looks like the highlight is right in the middle of it. So if you are the sun, you see highlights right in the middle of every round object. So that's why when photographers take a flash picture of an owl, and here's the owl's eye, right? 
They take a flash picture of the um, owl's eye. They get a highlight that is right in the middle. Now this be say a great horned owl or something with a yellow iris, right? So you see that little highlight right in the center? You start looking around on a lot of owl photographs and you will see that highlight right in the middle of the eye. Sometimes it looks like this. There's a little dot in the middle of it. There's a, a little ring of light. That's because they're using a ring flash. So you're seeing a reflection of the flash bulb in the critter's eye. So if you're drawing a, and, and that's what's, what's going on here. Um, this has a reflection right in the middle of it because the light is coming from the same place as the camera. Now, as, um, I'm going to move my head and I'm going to move my head over to this side here. And I'm going to point out to you where on the apple I now see the highlight. So if I have my head over on this side here, I am now seeing the highlight right here. See, I moved my head and I get a different highlight. I can move my head over to this side and I'm now seeing the highlight right here. So I can move my head towards the bottom here. I can get the highlight right here. I'm seeing the highlight here. You're seeing the highlight right up in here. So the highlight is relative to where you are. And it's not going to always, it's not going to be right underneath. It's not going to be in the same place as the brightest part, the part of the apple that has the most light on it, because unless, uh, unless the light is also the, um, the, the, the light is also the, uh, the, the, the place where the camera is or your eye is. So for, if I was taking a look at the um, eye of this owl, and the light were coming from the side, there is a light off on the side, then what you're going to see is a highlight somewhere off there. So um, if you don't want to draw an owl in being photographed um, and you want it to sort of be out there somewhere, you know, with, with natural light, then don't put that, that reflection right there um, where the, uh, the, the center of the, the, the eye is. Also, here's another cool thing. The iris is kind of set back. And so an owl's eye will actually shade the top of the owl's eye. So the top of the owl's eye will actually be in shade because of that kind of big owl brow. But still the outside of the owl, so the shadow is cast. Um, here's, here's, here's a side view of the owl's eye. You've got this tissue coming back here. Here's the the pupil in the middle and the eye is gonna come back like this. Shadow can be cast on this part up here and the reflection can be out here on the top. So the shadow, you can have the reflection on top of the shadow on the back of that eye, isn't that cool? Makes that reflection show up just a little bit better. <clears throat> so if I want to put in a highlight here what I want to do is on my actual object, look where I see my, um, where my, where I see my shadow. I'm going to just smear all this together so I can get kind of a gray tone in here. 
because then get the darker part to be darker again. There we go. So I'm gonna put in a little bit of reflected light here. I'm gonna bring back just a little bit of the center light in that area. And then I'm going to put in my highlight as my sort of super bright spot at a point not directly under where the light is. Closer to the side where, where I'm viewing from. So on a sort of, let me see if I can do by drawing this a little bit smaller, see if I can get better values in. I'm gonna get dark on the bottom. Oops, that's not what I wanted to do. Let me try that again. So I'm gonna try one more time, this time being a little bit more careful. I'm gonna draw a ball. And if this is where my lightest part is gonna be, I'm gonna draw just some light circles around here. And I'm gonna start going out from that. As I do, I'm gonna to start to press a little bit harder. And then as I get down here, I'm going to press more and more and more. and put in some sort of darkest core shadow down here. All right. So if I want there to be a highlight on this, again, I'm not putting the highlight right there in the center of the lightest spot. That's where, that's the spot that is below the light, but I am putting my highlight further down towards the darkness so that it, it's going to show up better, right? And, um, and it's not directly under my light. So highlights are strange things because again, we're so tempted just to think that is the highlight there. But we're now making just a real important distinction between the difference between the spot on the object that is below the light and the highlight, which is um, the relationship between where the light is and where your eye is. Again, everybody has a different highlight. And highlights can really help you show the texture of a surface. Um, let's take a look at, um, like sometimes when I'm, when I'm draw doing an, an entomological illustration, I will, um, here's part of the back of a beetle. And the back of a beetle can have, if we'll have a side view of it here, there'll be bumps. A back of a beetle could also have pits. So how would bumps and pits look if you, if your light is coming from this direction here. So I'm gonna just draw some parallel lines in here. These are all my light direction. Light is coming in at the same angle all the way across here. That means this surface that is facing towards the light is going to be in the light and the other side of it is going to be in shadow. So on these bumps, there's gonna be a light side and a shadow side, and then a little cast shadow. If I think of this bump as a little bit of a larger thing, 
you can imagine the beam of light coming along from this direction. If the beam of light comes across here, then all this area here is gonna be in shadow and it's gonna have a cast shadow up until that point right there. If there's a pit, let's draw the pit bigger. And the light is coming in at the same direction. That means this surface here gets the brightest, most direct light. And this surface here is all in shadow. So that means this surface here would be in shadow. This surface here is in shadow. This surface here is in shadow. Notice that where the shadows are and where the, um, the, the, the light and the shadow sides are, on these two things, it's reversed. So if I want there to be a bump on this sphere, if there's a bump that is sticking up, the light is coming in from this direction. Well, I'm going to get a different eraser out here. For this, having a fine tipped eraser is going to be helpful. Where is that little eraser? Oh dear. Oh, I know what happened. I gave my eraser to Carolyn. <laughs> I need to replace my little fine tipped eraser. Well, I'll, I'll use just this big one on the back of my pencil. All right. Um, let's say there's a bump that is sticking out right here on this object. And I'll see if we can get better focus. A little bit of glare there. Let me see if I can. There's some glare off the graphite pencil. Let me see if I can take care of that. All right. So I want there to be in this area right here on this sphere, I want there to be a bump that sticks out. So I am going to put a little erasure point in here. And on the side here where the light is, I am going to I'm gonna put shadow in on one side and I can even have some cast shadow out behind that. And then on the other side, I want there to be light because the light will be catching this surface here. And then the, um, the, the bump will be coming um, on. So I'm gonna have light catching this surface and the shadow out on the opposite side of it. If there were a pit in it, I'm going to put a pit over here. And where did I put my, I never put my eraser. I'm going to put a pit right over here. So this time light is going to come by and it's going to put this surface here in shadow. And the light on the other side will catch will catch the light. So that gives me a little divot. in this object. And this side here, I'm 
is a little bump on the object. If this is a really shiny object, it will, um, in addition to these light and dark sides, it is going to have a really bold highlight. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put some paint on top of this. Where's my rag? There you go. So I'm going to put some paint down here. And then it's going to get, let's see, I'm, I'm gonna, let's see if I can go over this. So I'm going to make this the lightest side. Then that's going to get increasingly dark towards this direction. I'm going to have a little bit of reflected light come in here. What I'm doing is I'm just brushing paint off of my, my brush. So my brush is empty and just coming along and tickling that edge there to kind of pick up a little bit of reflected light. And make this a little bit more smooth. And that will do. Now I'm gonna let this dry. Maybe before it does, I'm gonna see if I can pick, lift out just a little bit of paint from here, from this side of the divot and from this side of the bump. Now this needs to dry a little bit more. All right. <clears throat> I'm gonna let this set for a moment and I will come back to this drawing. In the meantime, um, let's take a look at the uh, uh, at the long necked bird. All right. So when I am when I'm drawing um, long necked birds one of the most useful things to do is to initially get just the negative shape behind the neck, usually behind the neck. So I've got the bird, it's lifting its head up and I'll go, you know, what is, the, what is that shape as you kind of come down the neck to the body? And for different species, it'll be different kinds of angles. For things like geese, and, uh, and, and cranes, it'll be a little bit more smooth. For things like a heron or an egret, um, it will often be very angular. So have more corners in it. But look at just sort of what is the sweep that you get. Also, as a heron or egret straightens their neck, it loses more of those angles. But usually, there's a little bit of a crook in it. Then what I do is I think about the distance from the back of the neck to the front of the neck. And on a lot of birds, it's going to be a little bit thicker towards the base and then thinner as you get 
closer, um, further up. So just to put in a couple of little dots. So you put a little placeholder here, 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 a few little dots just to <clears throat> make sure I don't make my neck too thick or too skinny. And then you're putting in the negative shape that you see in front of those. So you've got the negative shape that you had at the back and then the negative shape that you have in the front. You're not just connecting dots. Notice how I missed this dot here. If you just put in dots and go dot to dot, you'll kind of over smooth it. So you really want to look at still what is the negative shape. All these dots are doing is generally getting the neck to be the right thickness at the bottom and generally getting the neck to be the right thickness at the top. Um, if you're doing a heron or an egret, there will be really sharp angles towards the upper part of the neck and in the, in the front and really sh sharp angles a little bit further down on the neck in the back. So look for really hard corners in heron and egret necks. Um, then you give your bird a little bit of the underside of its head before you kind of come out with the beak. So there is a sandhill crane and a, uh, and a heron. And <clears throat> so the, the, the key points are, you first look at the shape of the negative shape. Your first line is what is that, that, that shape in the back of the neck and then the start of the back. A few spacers. Not too many, or, you're, or it's impossible to not do the dot to dot. If you get too many dots in there, you will do dot to dot. Um, this is more of a kind of a loon. <clears throat> But the, uh, but to get that long neck, those negative shapes, front and back, are what are really going to kind of pop those in for you. Um, what I used to do is I would sometimes draw the back of the neck. And then I would draw the front of the neck and I'd get these just, if I was sort of just following it kind of on autopilot, then I would get these things that sort of just looked like a garden hose. So to avoid the garden hose neck, you're really looking for those angles. And again, on a herons and egret, these two angles here are gonna be really interesting. All right, this guy's drawing out. All right, hey, that's starting to look like a little divot over there. Isn't that cool? Now, I put some tone across this thing because once I put some tone across it, you'll be able to see highlights too. Right now, this is a dull ball with you know some wrinkles in it and two bumps. If I want it to be a shiny ball, I need to give it some sparkle, some, so if it's, if it's a matte, so matte means not shiny, right? Glossy is the opposite of matte. So if it's a matte surface, there are not highlights on it. If I want to turn this into a shiny reflective surface, that's where the highlights come in. So, I'm going to, on this surface here, I'm gonna put a little highlight on this side of this thing that sticks out. And I'm gonna put a little highlight right on the edge of where the divot is. Yeah, 
And I'm going to put a highlight not on the brightest part of this thing, but um, just a little bit off to the side of that. If you're drawing from real objects, all you have to do is look at the, the shape of the real object that's in front of you and, um, and note where the highlight is on it. What I found that I used to do is I would always put my highlight here just because it just seems so natural to me to put it there. And it didn't occur to me to look in a place other than that sort of center light position to find my, 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 the location of my highlight. But now knowing that they're different phenomenon, all I do is just, I just you know, look at where is that highlight coming in on my object and oh, that's where I'm going to put it. But it used to really confuse me because I would try to, if I did start with the highlight and then I would sort of fade things out from there, then my shadows would be all off. <clears throat> Now knowing that those are different phenomenon, it's a lot easier. Give myself a little bit more reflected light down in here. And uh, there you go, which gives us just five minutes for the coyote versus fox. So all I want to do on the coyote versus fox front is just say there's, there's just point out some differences with proportions. Actually, let's jump to a brand new fresh slate. Where are we? Pencil, come back. There you are. All right. Um, so I'm going to draw a little canid. I've got the line that comes down the back over the booty and out the tail. Now, so that as, as, as critters are moving around that line at the back, remember how we, with those, the neck before we started with that negative shape, same sort of a thing here. I'm gonna start with that. That's my sort of first go-to line. And then I want to, to sort of think of this body as, as being three parts. There's, the, there's the, the, the chest part, there is the ball of the tummy, and then there's the hips. So these are three kind of balls. And, and masses. I'm going to start with a fox, because this is looking more foxy to me. Um, from my up here, I'm going to have a ball of my head with a little tube that sticks out from it. And neck that comes down into my body. My tail is going to be bigger, longer, and fuller. And I'm just going to put some of these contour lines around that tail for now, just to remind me to kind of keep that a rounded, a rounded shape. <clears throat> to make this foxy, I want my legs to be relatively short compared to the coyote. So um, the legs in the, uh, the front, you're gonna come in not, you're not gonna draw the legs from here, from this corner here. The legs are gonna be stepped back a little bit. And the back leg is the one that has that backwards facing
I might have made these legs just a little bit too short. Kind of looking a little bit wiener doggy here. <laughs> Especially on that back leg. I want my back legs to come down to the same, same point here. Um, there we go. That's looking a little bit more foxy. Um, then, you know, proportionally large ears. And notice that the, 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 just the proportions on the leg here are, they're, they're, they're shorter. The head is also proportionately kind of large on this thing. It kind of gives it a cute feel. Now I want to turn this more coyote. So what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to lengthen the legs. I'm going to shorten the ears and maybe thin out that snout, kind of reduce the tail. And we'll see if I can kind of get this guy to be a little bit more coyote. And so on my coyote, I'm going to bring my feet down just a little bit further. Those, those, those other legs now are kind of looking like the back legs sort of more foreshortened. That's kind of cool. I think I'm going to, I didn't intend to that for that, but now I'm going to say like, yeah, I meant for that to happen. So there's the little platform that it's standing on. I'm going to give it kind of an ear job. All right, so I just reduce the size of the ear. And it's also going to get a tail tuck. And the thing is sort of transformed more into a coyote shape. Now in winter time, um, in, so in cold places, coyotes will um, have a really nice thick coat. So a winter coyote could even be like that. Um, also might kind of make this back leg a little bit more shaggy. If you've, you've ever combed a dog, you know that the back leg right here is there's a ton of little shaggy fur that you get in here. Um, and also down here on the belly. So that just sort of makes your doggies, um, you, know, you can get, that just then kind of fluff them out more. And also if this is a coyote, then of course it has that black tail tip. Like a gray fox. Um, but the uh, red fox has a white tail tail. So there is just a little bit of proportions, kind of taking of something that looks too, if it looks too foxy, what are the things that I need to kind of tweak and change about that to turn it over into something more of a coyote shape and uh, kind of go back and forth between those two. Um, and, uh, you know, then a, a lot of people are not really picking up on those sort of subtle differences. Like you could take something with these sort of proportions of a, give it a white tail and paint it red. Everyone's like, oh, you drew a fox. But for us sort of nature journalists, we're kind of doing kind of a deeper dive. And we, so we're paying attention to things like the proportions and those sorts of details. Um, but Basically, if you get something that kind of has a dog shape and you paint it red, everybody says, oh, you drew a fox. 
So there is, let me, hey, Brian, check that out. Three topics, one class. So productive, amazing. <laughs> Awesome. All right. Um, so I hope that uh, some of these strategies and ideas are um, helpful to you folks um, and that you can have some fun, fun playing with those. It's, it is neat to kind of take a, a drawing of, um, you know, if let's say you have a pet cat to draw your pet cat and then see like figure out what do I need to do on the paper to change my pet cat into a lion. So part of it is don't make your first pet cat lines too strong because you're going to be drawing over this. But it just gets you thinking about like, I'm going to make this head like, I'm going to change it like this. And like, oh, actually, I need to make the head smaller. And, you know, or like wh whatever it is. And then you figure out like, how can you do that? So is, is the pet cat just a lion? Um, do, you, do you stick a mane on your pet cat and you get the right shape? It'll be fun to play with. Um, but that you kind of can see that going on with that fox and, uh, and coyote comparison there. I hope that that was was, was fun for everybody. Um, what I'd like to do now is jump over to the Nature Journal Club community cam. And the way this works is that if you, uh, by the way, before I do this, if you do not want to be filmed, if you don't want to be on the video, then hide your um, turn off your, your screen. Um, we're going to jump over to the community cam. Anybody who wants to share something, all you have to do is hold it up to the screen like this, and, and I'll see you. And um, then uh, we will spotlight you. We can talk about your what you're doing, give you some feedback, um, give you a chance to share. So that might be something that you're doing in this class, or it might be um, uh, other nature journal pages that you've been working on that you've been having fun with. It's really neat to see kind of people's what, what folks are up to. Um, and then we'll do that for a little bit and then we will turn off the recording. And so anybody who wants to share but doesn't feel comfortable um, being put on the video that I then share on YouTube, um, we will uh, uh, we'll have a, a chance for you to, to share. Um, I am, though, going to have to leave in about 15 minutes um, because I've got a commitment on the back side of this. Um, but if you are uh, able to stick around, you can, we'll be able to see what our friends have been up to. Again, thank you, everybody in this community, for being here. Um, and um, all right, I see Ray Bonto has been drawing spheres and uh, foxes. So first jump to Ray Bonto and then over to Mary. Um, let's see, we'll make we'll allow you to unmute yourself in just a moment once we can. Yeah, so um, it was great. I expected to be uh, divided equally, like 20 minutes, 20 minutes, 20 minutes. <laughs> oh, um, well, <laughs> I, okay. that was actually my original plan. Uh, but I just had uh, kind of got so much into trying to figure out how to shine lights on apples that uh, it, uh, it, uh, it took up all our, our, our time there, so. Yeah. Uh, um, um, I saw you smearing it and I was like, oh no, he's smearing it because I used a black Prisma color pencil instead of oh, a Oh, yes, yes. Well, isn't, isn't that a wonderful thing about the Prisma colors? They're so much less smeary. Yeah. Yeah. And I absolutely love that about Prisma color is that you can get in there and, um, and, and draw, and it's not just making this big gray smudge cloud. A lot of graphite drawings just turn into you know, like the giant smudge in time, but Prismacolors are, are, are much more cooperative. Yeah, yeah. I also, actually, um, so I, I've, I've taken in an interest in um, black and white sketches. From William D. Berry, yeah, I like that. Oh, 
Oh, what fun. Yeah, isn't it amazing? He does all that stuff just with graphite pencil, right? And black prismacolor color to get the dark value. <laughs> nice. Yeah, I mean, uh, that's me, not him. But yeah, I used a black prismacolor color after graphite. And because I thought I should try graphite again after a few months. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah it, it, it's neat to see how much he gets with that. And those those resting uh, dogs top right, those wolves or, or dogs there, really you can kind of feel that the anatomy under those, those, those points of the skin. And I also like on the walking wolf, just you kind of get the feeling of the, of its, of its kind of, you know, head down lope. Very, very emotive of the, Sort of the, the feeling of movement. I get the feeling of movement from those. Mm, yeah, yeah. I, I, I like to uh, color sketches, um, but then I thought, oh, why don't I use um, uh, graphite? And it's quite, uh, and then I, and then I uh, turned the color sketches into black and white, and I kept the black and whites, black and white. <laughs> uh. Good, you're, you're just, you're innovating, you're, you're playing with it, you're experimenting, and that's exactly what you should do. Everybody notice that, um, so Ray Bonto could not get the full value range with just graphite. So he grabbed his black Prismacolor pencil and that allows him to push his dark values all the way to 11. So um, yeah, see how, you, you're wondering like, how can I get my darks dark? Black Prismacolor is your friend. Prismacolor's got your back there. Yeah. Um, I've also decided to do that one pencil all values thing. Uh, in these, I use graphite here. And then I put the black Prismacolor to do the full uh, dark outline and it's, um, and then I decided to use a violet pencil here. I decided to use just a blue pen, indigo blue pencil here. And I decided to use a dark green pencil here. And oh, I, I love dark these brown here. And here I decided to use black gray. And it and black gray uh, came out the best. Uh, it, black gray. That's a solid pencil. I, I, I've, I've got, I carry extra black grapes with me because you just find so many uses for it. Oh, oh, this, this, what's going on here with these little uh, monochromatic value studies, this is really exciting. This is really exciting. So to describe for folks again, what you're doing here for uh, people are wondering like, I'd like to get some of this action going on in my journal. Let, let's, let's hear, so what's, what's your, your, your strategy and your, your kind of mindset as you're going into so, these, what are you focusing on? So I just use the outline, uh, I just use everything, including the outline um, with the pencil for the values. Um, I recommend you use dark values, then you get the dark colors, even if it's not completely black. Um, and here I use black grape um, um, and it was the same, and I, I did the absolute blacks in the uh, in the concentrated black grape, and um, yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, this is really really solid. That's very exciting to see. This is also a whole new direction for you. You are not stuck in any rut here. You're really bursting out and pushing yourself, challenging yourself, giving yourself new prompts and challenges. I love these studies. I love these yeah. studies. I also sketched, a, today I sketched a red tail hawk with um, a water soluble pencil. Uh, yeah, because it smudges, if you leave it alone, I and I don't have any fixative, I used a fine point brush and I went along the outlines. Uh, Great. And, yeah. Oh, these values are, it, it, it's, it's, this is so exciting. Um, Ray Bonto, I think we're, we're seeing another 
kind of step in the evolution of your drawing and rendering skills. Um, really exciting to see. Pencil miles are paying off for you, my friend. You're getting some big thumbs up from this group. Um, you know, I have a few recommendations for colored pencils for your sketches. Yes, tell us. These are all from Prismacolor, but you can get them from any company. Um, so I, uh, there's a dark brown pencil, and you know that. You can use a magenta pencil. Uh, and um, this, you can use a cyan pencil for sketching. You could use a black grape pencil for sketching. Uh, that's the one I used. Most importantly, I found this new Prismacolor pencil called Black Raspberry. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's it, it's also quite nice for sketching. So, which one is that? Uh, it's from Prismacolor Premium. Okay. Yeah. It's black raspberry. It, it's quite a rich color. Ooh, ooh, that is nice. Yeah. Ooh, I'm gonna write that down. So, black raspberry. Check out black raspberry. Prismacolor pencil. Hey, thank you so much for sharing that. Thank you. Great. Um, so now, um, Mary, I'm going to jump to you. Thank you so much. Oh, you've been working the nest action. Um, even just in the little thumbnail, I see just depth in these. This is going to be really fun to see. Let's check out what uh, Mary has been up to. These are, um, uh, you know, last week, the nests in class. And I just sort of painted along. Now I had, um, I love to draw and paint nests. I, I, uh, and I collect them. A friend of mine sent me, let's see, if maybe I need to put something behind. You know, this reversal thing is, tough. <laughs> it, it, it was driving me nuts today. I, I, feel, <laughs> really your pain, hard. I feel your pain. Anyway, my friend from the country sent me um, a little <laughs> nest to, that I drew from, that I drew from very, a lovely little nest, very organized and well made. How do you find out what kind of bird the nest is from she doesn't know I asked her and she um she didn't know she thought maybe a finch or something is there a, is there a resource for that yes there's there's actually a field guide to bird nests and 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 signs so there are field guides to that there's a okay. bunch of the of, of them that just sort of just like with mushrooms there's this category that they have with identifying mushrooms called little brown mushrooms and <laughs> yeah. um it's just a few people can tell them apart and bird nests are the same way. There's some types where you can like, oh, look, it's got this mud layer. You found a robin nest. That's right? rob. And yeah. um, so some <laughs> of them, they're like these, these, these tells that are in it. But for a bunch of them, you kind of go like, like, or, or like a, a, a vireo nest. You, you get a vireo nest the way that it's attached to this little hanging basket. You go like, yeah. oh, vireo nest. Yeah. Um, but for a, a bunch of the, you know, little cup nests, um yeah like, it's, wow. yeah it's, it's a little bird um and it's using very little i mean the the uh, sticks and the straw it uses or whatever these are, are very small in diameter so i figure it was a very small bird and um you know what we get in the east coast for nesting are things like um warblers and warblers and finches arrows i don't i i don't know um okay so so i will consult a field guide i guess yeah so there, there are the field size, guides to them size. Um, um elbrock um has a really good um uh, book out on 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 mammals uh on a uh, on, on on bird sign also uh, he's a mm -hmm. very uh, good tracker um so i would check that out mm -hmm. 
Um, but 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 you're absolutely right. It's 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 tough. But uh, bring this back to those sketches you did um, for just a moment because but one more clue that might help is there's a tiny. I don't want to get it out. I'll lose it. But there's a tiny fragment of the bird shell, and oh, that wow. might help because it's blue. It's a it's a beautiful. It's you know it's a beautiful shade of a blue green. So maybe that will help for the eggs. Yeah. I don't know. I think it, that 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 can narrow it down. Maybe. Um, <laughs> yeah. So on these, I want everybody to notice how what what, what probably maybe we could hold it just a slightly closer to the screen if we could. And there we go. What what most of us notice first off is just the texture. So Mary, you're rocking the texture, but what is more solid, um, uh, subtle and but perhaps more important is notice the way that she is showing the planes in the surface of the nest so you can actually see the plane of the top surface there's a value change it changes to a lighter value when it drops down on the side and she's very deliberately deliberately using this top left hand lighting to show the you know so she's got the shadow on the inside of the nest on the left, on the outside of the nest on the right, and then not in the, um, and not showing on that whole kind of a ring around the sides. So the structure of these with value comes across so clearly. And also notice in those nests and those places where you have darker values popping in uh, between some of those uh, fibers in it, you really get the sense of the the nest having depth to it. You could put your little finger in there. You could take your little pencil and 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 put it in between those. And so she's punched in the values in a few key spots. She's showing the structure with those values changing where the planes change. I really want people to notice how she's defined the planes. And then uh, what trick were you using for getting the texture of the nests? Um, neg I, uh, negative space. So in other words, drawing a, sort of around the, the twigs, making the dark around. Um, that, that was what I did. And then I even used some of that gel pen. Oh. Sorry. And and I was pleased because it came out pretty fine. Um, yeah. I was scared it would be too thick and I don't know, I was scared it would look fake, but but it kind of picked up a few highlights. Yeah, they're and great for nice. that. They're I, I was cold. happy. Yeah, I was happy. Yeah. So, and and then yeah, and I I also mean, I want to compliment you on something. You then showed restraint. You put a few little highlights in with your gel pen, and then everybody check this out. She stopped. It is so much fun to put in those little highlights on those yeah, fibers. It's cool. That it's easy yeah. to overdo it. Right. But um, this is an obsession for me, Ness. So <laughs> that's great. Of a lot. <laughs> I really love it. That's so much fun. Yeah. That's really fun. Mary, thank you so much for sharing. And I just want to say something about Ray Bonto's animals. I looked at them and I thought of, I, we once went to these cave paintings in France, prehistoric, but beautiful, very sophisticated animals on the Let's wall. Go. All what? No, not that one. You can't go. It was another one with horses. And his, his, Animals remind me, in the monochrome, remind me of those. Oh, that's And they're fun. very elegant and sophisticated. It's not like primitive. It, it's quite amazing when you yeah. stay there and think these were done in the cave. Yeah, those cave prehistoric men doing these incredible animals. And um, they were They knew their anatomy, didn't they? They knew their anatomy. They, so they knew their animal. Well, I guess they had to eat or they'd starve. So they yeah. did. But um, they reminded me so much of those. It was great to see. Thank oh. you. Um, Thank you, so, Ray Bonto. Yeah, <laughs> bravo.
Bravo. Uh, no. <laughs> yes, yeah, sorry to interrupt, but uh, I, I had a picture and they look just like it. <laughs> oh, cool. You I did? Looked, you looked at those? I didn't go there, cool. I a picture of an orc. Oh, I love it. I love it. Good for you. That is really great. Yeah. Uh, hey, everybody, I'm now going to turn off the recording.